Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to the Health Made Simple Show. This is Dr. Bart. I am your host. And in this episode, we have an amazing topic. And we're going to talk about all about the foundations of health. And listen, I know that's probably not the most sexy title. And maybe you're thinking, oh, I'd rather talk about the five biohacks to health and whatnot. But listen, these foundations, these are this is where the rubber hits the road. This is probably the single most important thing that we can do in our journey toward health. And with that being said, you can use this as a checklist today. I'm going to go through three different pillars of your health, the foundations of health that we can't skip. Folks, you cannot skip the foundations no matter what else you're doing, no matter else, what else you're trying, whatever magic, literally whatever diet, hot, cold therapy, whatever it may be, vitamin, herb, whatever it may be that's out there that we hear at sex, or you maybe even heard me talk about, these are the foundations. And if you're skipping these, you're going to continuously find yourself coming back and never really reaching that area that you want when it comes to your health and your vitality. So we're going to dive in just a minute. And again, thank you for being here and keep doing your thing. Keep sharing it out. Keep spreading the love. We really never know when we do share something and we spread the love a little bit where it lands and what other people might be impacted and how you may be able to affect their lives in a positive way. So wherever you are, whether it's on Spotify or YouTube or Apple if you can leave us a great rating, we appreciate that and keep spreading it out, keep sharing it out, keep doing keep doing your thing. All right, so let's dive in. Welcome, nice to have you. And let's start dive into the three pillars, the foundations of your health. And we're going to start right away. And I'll tell you what they are right away. They are about moving, eating, and thinking. And let's dive in a little bit to what those details are. And even though I'm not going to tell you all the different ways to move today, we'll talk about how and what we mean about the foundations of being able to move properly. All right. So there's really three things when it comes to our movement. And again, let's not overlook these. This is so important. I've had the opportunity for the last almost three decades now, 27 years as a chiropractor, being able to observe what happens when people can't move anymore. And I'll start by saying this. Listen, when it comes to movement, the first topic we're going to talk about is range of motion. There's three parts of movement that I want you to kind of give yourself a little bit of a checklist or observe how you are in these three categories. How are you moving? What is your range of motion, your flexibility? How flexible are you? And then also we're going to talk about strength and stamina. So one of the things I've noticed over the last almost three decades of practicing is that the only time anyone ever complains of being old, and it's never about their chronological age, and it's never about how much pain they're in or not in, it always comes down to how well they can move. And I've also observed that when we don't move right, the choices we have in life change. And that is why I want to tell you right now, don't skip this part. Don't think that you're you're too far past, you're too tight, you're too weak, you don't have enough stamina. If you improve any one of those areas, you're improving your vitality and you're going to have more choices in life. What do I mean by that? Choices literally to go on a long hike, the choice to go on a vacation, maybe over to Europe where it takes a lot of stamina or energy, maybe to pick up your, your grandkids, maybe just the ability to have the strength to pick up your groceries tomorrow. Those are choices that sometimes we take for granted. And yet being able to observe what I've observed over the last close to three decades now, it's become crystal clear to me that movement is an overlooked part of our health and our vitality. It'll never be measured in your doctor's office unless you get really, really lucky. Yet it's not going to be measured. It's not going to, we're not going to have conversations about it until it's gone. So let's dive in here. And again, three pillars today, we're going to talk about how you move, how you eat, and how you think. Use this as a checklist to see where you're at and then get to work. All right. So number one is this, when it comes to movement, how is your range of motion? And often I will have people say to me, Doc, man, I've always been tight. No, you haven't. You were born very flexible. You're born like Gumby. You die with rigor mortis. So we want to find ourselves somewhere along this pendulum of what direction are we heading into? So your range of motion, literally your flexibility. And often I will find people even thinking, well, um, I used to be able to this and therefore I can't anymore or I can't do this anymore. Don't give up on yourself that easy. Your body is so amazing that it has so much potential. It's just a matter of whether you're giving it. So if you're having a harder time right now, getting out of bed, if you're having a harder time tying your own shoes, putting on your clothes, turning around in the car, going in reverse, the fundamentals here, or you find yourself saying things like, oh, I can't do that anymore. Every time I do that, I pull a muscle or I injure my shoulder or my elbow, my knee, whatnot. Recognize that if you lose range of motion, you lose capacity to move your body 
in this thing that we call life. So if you're not already engaged in some type, I mean, here's how you know. This, this, how, this, is, this is where the rubber hits the road. It's this simple. Either you are currently working on improving your range of motion or you're not. And if you're not working on it, it's declining. And the reason it's declining because our lifestyles are not set up to be uh, set us. They don't set us up to be flexible. In fact, it's just the opposite. They actually set us up to become tight and rigid, yeah. sitting in our chairs, sitting in our cars and sitting on our couches and our dinner tables with all that repetitive action over and over and over and over and over again, we continue to lose range of motion. And there's another part of this, certainly when it comes to the mentality uh, there's that old saying, uh, you know, a rigid mind is rigid body. So, you know, keep that in thought as well. But in the event that you find yourself waking up every day and do nothing about your range of motion, know this, you're getting tighter. It might not be noticeable, but it's happening. And these are compounding effects. They, you don't wake up one day and be like, oh, my, this is the day that I can't touch my toes anymore. It happens day after day after day of not doing it, of day after day of not stretching, not limbering yourself up after a long car ride or whatnot. So there are so, so many things we can do. And I'm not going to do a deep dive into the ways to become flexible again, but know that needs to be on your radar. But some of the simple things, listen, I'm a big advocate of yoga because it significantly changed my life. It was the one thing that allowed me to get back to the thing that I have so much passion and fun doing in my life, which is the martial arts. But because I was becoming stiff and rigid, I was getting injured all the time. So I'm, I kind of got out of martial arts for several years, five, six, seven years, and focused solely on my yoga practice to get my body back to being limber, back to being able to move better so I can do the things that I love in my life. And I want you to think about that very same thing. What is it that you love to do in your life that maybe you might be giving up if you get any more tighter? So things like yoga and Pilates and physical therapy, there are so many things out there you can do. And listen, I know also that especially as a guy, if you're hearing me say yoga, it's intimidating because you, you, you're going to suck at it. And don't let your ego get in front of your life. So I'm saying this to guys and girls because the next one will be a little more applicable to the girls. So don't let your ego and not being good at something get in front of your ability to have a good high quality life. So number one is this range of motion. Number two, listen, we got to get stronger. You have to have strength. And it doesn't necessarily work in this order, but it kind of does as well. So we got to get better at being mobile. We got to be able to move our bodies. And then we got to develop some strength. Why do we need strength? We need strength simply to be able to be active in life. The simple things, pick up a grandkid, pick up a dog, pick up your groceries to get yourself up and out of bed. If you're not getting stronger this year, you're getting weaker. And again, this is your checklist. So you got to ask yourself, am I doing things right now to make a stronger human being, a stronger version of myself physically? Yes, my muscles. Am I breaking them down and building them up on a regular basis? Am I preparing my body to be able to break down and build up? Because that is the anti-aging game. So again, real simple, check in, check out. Are you doing these things? And if not, and again, I won't go into the details, but listen, anything. Get some weights, get some bands, start exercising. It doesn't take much, but we need to be doing it. And yes, some is always better than none. One of the challenges I think I see probably most frequently, and I'll touch on this a little bit, is let's just say you used to exercise in your life and then you got out of it for one reason or another, your family got in the way or business got in the way or whatever it may be, maybe an old injury. Oftentimes, we think that the only way back in is that we have to be able to go to the gym for an hour at a time. And listen to me, you don't have to exercise for an hour every day. If you do, fantastic, but you don't have to. To be a healthy, strong human being, you can do it in a fraction of the time. Do you need to set some time aside to break down tissue and build it back up? Absolutely, you do. But in the event that you're not doing it at all, know that some is better than none. Doing a couple push-ups today is better than doing none today. Doing a couple standing squats today is better than doing none. And as you start to do that and you find that it's easier and easier, it makes it easier again the next time. So now we have with the movement, we have range of motion. We have strength. You're checking yourself. Am I getting better? Do I have a plan today for these things? These are the foundations. And then the third one we're talking about is, is endurance. And this one's a little harder to map out, but it's important. Endurance, stamina. Can you go outside and work in the yard for four or five hours? Can you go for a hike? Can you go for a four, five, six mile hike? Can you do the things that you once were able to do when you were young? Or are those things, things you just completely avoid? And all three of these kind of work in harmony, yet I will tell you, you got to work on the range of motion first 
So then you can build some strength so you don't create muscle imbalances. And as you get the range of motion and some strength back, then you start to work on your endurance. Can you kind of do it all at the same time? Yeah, absolutely. So think of those three things. Are you doing anything right now that requires physical stamina? Or every time it gets a little bit cushy, a little bit hard, you bail out and you take a break and or you have to go eat something? Or are you giving yourself the opportunities to push? You've probably, if you've been, you know, paying attention or listening to our Health Made Simple podcast, you've heard me talk about a couple couple concepts, a couple ideas, one being this natural state of hormesis, which is basically naturally putting yourself under a little bit of stress so you become a stronger human being. And that's what hormesis is, a natural state of stress that makes us stronger. So we have to allow ourselves to go for that walk that's a little longer than normal, to go for the hike that was harder than we expected. Even though we may not be fully prepared for it, we're still putting our bodies and our minds in these positions that, you know what, this might not go awesome, but I'm going to do it anyways. And therefore, I have the experience of what I need to do in the future to be able to do that. The other thing I'll throw in here, and again, I'm not going to do deep deep dive on this yet. There are these cells in our bodies. They're called senescent cells. And we don't hear too much talk about it, but basically these are the cells that have aged. They're no longer working at a high level. They're not optimal anymore. The bummer is that they're hanging around in our bodies. And the more they hang around, the more it downregulates mitochondrial function and literally our optimal state of being because we have all these other cells in there that are kind of mixing with our good cells that just aren't doing a good job anymore. They're not optimally functioning. When we exercise, when we have flexibility and we can get our muscles and our lymphatic, our muscles pumping and moving, we get our lymph system and our cardiovascular system, we get everything pumping and moving, we help to eliminate these senescent cells. So through movement, through increasing your range of motion, through increasing your strength, through, through increasing, increasing your, your cardiovascular system, your stamina, you start to remove these senescent cells and you begin the process of anti-aging. So that's pillar number one. And be, be honest with yourself. Where are you when it comes to those three things? Do you have any program in place? And if not, beautiful, because now you at least recognize there's an easy place to start. You can do something and that would be better than nothing. All right, let's slide into pillar number two here. And this one will be the easiest first to cover, but it might be the hardest for the general public. And that is how we eating. So we're talking about how you move, how you eat, and how you think. And these are the foundations of our health. There's no skipping these three things. There's no bypassing them, no matter what our favorites are or whatnot. We have to get these things right in order for us to be in the journey or on the path of becoming the best versions of ourselves. So when it comes to eating, it's real simple. In an ideal world, and there's a lot of good programs out there, but in an ideal world, we got to keep it clean, which means, and you've heard me say it here before in the Health Made Simple show, it's God's garden. Meaning that if it comes from a root, a plant, a tree, if it walks in the garden or swims in the sea, eat it. And if it doesn't, don't. At some point, we have to get to the point of respecting, honoring, honoring, and loving our own body more than we do the donut, more than we do the soda, more than we do the pizza, more than we do the memory of drinking and eating and all of those things. The truth is our bodies were designed to be absolute powerful healing machines when and if we give them the right fuels. If we are putting chemicals into our body, and nowadays, folks, the reality is, here's the harsh reality. 80, 90% of the food that we have in our grocery stores have chemicals in them. So in that experience and education, when you're listening to this, you can't, can't deny these as they're not happening. They're not true. They are true. Once we start to recognize and, and kind of own up to that, then we have to make those decisions the decisions that I'm going to keep the bad food out. Are the other programs phenomenal like keto and carnivore and vegetarian diet and cleanses? All of those, Whole30, all of those are fantastic. But the premise that shares a commonality of all of those is one thing in that they all recognize the power of eating real food. Look at your diet today. Look at it yesterday. How much of it consists of only 100% organic clean foods? Be honest with yourself and don't justify it. Well, I'm better or this was just a little bit. It's only now and then occasionally. Allow yourself an opportunity to give yourself permission to hold yourself accountable. Like go for it. Go, go be the best version of yourself. See what happens when you go 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. This time is going to fly by anyway. What if you actually spent a year eating clean? Most of you, that would it would blow you away how much better of a human you would function as 
if you actually were clean for a year. Is, are things going to get in there inevitably that you don't know about? Sure. Through our waters and our pesticides and herbicides and things that are in the air and the electronics and whatnot. Yeah. But imagine if the things you did have control over, and that's a big one here, folks. These are just action steps that we do or do not take. You're choosing to eat every day. Might as well choose to make it good for you. Might, might as well choose to put things into your body that are going to build better cells. So a little sidetrack here, but this is, I think there's always a fascinating statistic to understand and how important every decision you make about your food that you bring into your body matters, because it really does. So one of the interesting and also I this thing, absolutely fascinating thing about the human body is that we make 2 million red blood cells per second. You heard that right. 2 million red blood cells per second. Now I want you to think about, okay, if I'm making 2 million red blood cells that my body is going to use to help develop other tissues, organs, going to supply other you know, parts of my body with oxygen, nutrients, and hormones, what are those cells being made of? If you were making 2 million red blood cells last night, for example, what did you, every second, what did you make those red blood cells of? Were you making them of good amino acids and proteins and good essential fatty acids, good clean fibers? Or are you making them with a glass of wine, some alcohol that's a toxin to the body? Or are you making it with genetically modified organism foods that have chemicals and pesticides and herbicides within the food itself? So ask yourself this question. And again, not to beat yourself up and not to think that it's not achievable because it is. Because there's literally thousands of millions of people there who choose to eat cleaner foods. And here's how this happens. When you start to look for it, it does appear. And when you start to focus on and looking for what you want versus what you can't have. And doing this as long as I have, especially in the nutritional space, if the focus is what you can't have, oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> it's hard to look at the menu and every time you look right at a pizza and be like, I can't have pizza, it has gluten in it. That's, that's going to be a tough victory to have. But if you start to look at menus and you start to go to the grocery store and you are looking for foods that come from God's garden, a root, a plant, a tree, something that walks in the garden, swims in the sea, then it becomes a lot easier to win this. So sec pillar number two, we got to get clean. Ask yourself, how clean are you day to day? Have you ever gone two, three, four, five days, 100% clean? Have you gone a week? Have you gone a month? Have you gone a year? Could you go a year? And again, no beating yourself up, no judging yourself, but continue to allow yourself to hold yourself to a standard that would be the best version of you. All right, let's slide into number three here. And this one's going to probably take a little bit of a different turn here. Pillar number three of the foundations of being healthy is about how you think. No doubt, positive thinking is no doubt one of the most powerful things we can do. And that's really not where I'm going to go with this one. I'm going to, I'm going to shift it a little bit. We know that positive thinking is, is definitely a better part of our lives. And it's certainly going to help us take better actions. And it's better for us. It gives us better energy, all the above. So I want you to take that, but I want to take this a little bit deeper. And I'm really going to tell you probably more po a more powerful component of the thinking when it comes to our health is the thinking of what philosophy you have about your body and your health, about your existence for that matter. So I want to talk to you a little bit about philosophy first. And this is part of what really shaped my career as a chiropractor and then into functional medicine, into Chinese medicine, into functional nutrition. It was all about this fundamental philosophy that honestly, I learned on day one of chiropractic school, and I'll share that with you. So philosophy really means is to have a philosophy means that you seek truth, you seek knowledge in the way that we do that. And I know this is a little deep. Just follow me here for a second, because some of you never considered. I never considered that I had a philosophy toward my health about who I was, about my well-being here in the face of this earth until that very first day in chiropractic school. And it's one of the reasons that I always have a profound love for the profession and its grassroots of how it started. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the chiropractic profession, we'll just sidetrack here for a quick second. The chiropractic flesh profession is based on three pillars. It's a science, a philosophy, and an art. So, of course, we use science about anatomy, physiology, and technology, but then there's also an art, and that's the ability, the techniques that we use to use our hands to help other people, to remove these things that's called subluxations, re remove these spinal misalignments so the body can function better. But it also, one of the premises, and this is probably what sep separates it from all other healing professions in the world, is its philosophy. And the philosophy is simple, that the body is a self-healing, self-regulating mechanism. 
I'm going to say that again. The philosophy is a, that the body itself is a self-healing, self-regulating mechanism, that the power that made the body heals the body, and it really doesn't happen any other way. So now, being that the philosophy is that the body can heal itself, now our job as individuals, or even as chiropractors or healthcare practitioners, to seek out and experience, are there truths in this? And can I support this truth to happen with ease and frequency? All right. So there's a lot right there for you. So let's let now, now let me kind of unravel this just a little bit. So let's just talk about the philosophy. Is there a philosophy and is there any truth to the fact that the body is a self-healing machine? And I'm going to give you an answer. Yes. And you've also experienced this. And I'll give you a simple example. Let's just say you've cut your arm. Everyone here has cut their finger, cut their arm, whatever it may be. And you do nothing and the body heals itself. So right then and there, we have evidence that the body is a self-healing, self-regulating mechanism, that you didn't have to do anything. Quite frankly, all you had to do was not interfere. That's a big part of this conversation. The big part of thinking is, are we allowing our bodies to be the best versions of themselves? Are we allowing this innate wisdom, the power that made the body, to heal the body? Or are we interfering with it? So when someone says, well, well, let's take another example. Let's just say that you have all kinds of pain in your body. Let's just say you've hurt yourself. Let's say you've hurt your shoulder somehow. So we have a couple options here. Can the body heal itself? And the answer is yes, it absolutely can. It doesn't matter what the injury is. The body can heal itself. We can get in the way though, because we put parameters on time. We put parameters on pain reduction. We put parameters on whether this is even right for us to experience what the body is going through. And I know this is kind of deep. And this is why I said this is a little bit of a twist versus just thinking good. But this, if you embrace a little bit, I'm not telling you to embrace my philosophy, but see if this fits for you. See if it fits with you, even your spirituality. If this fits in a place where you understand and recognize that your body is amazing and that it is a self-healing mechanism, that the power that made the body is what heals the body. And if we can get out of the way and start to support the body, we will see more and more evidence of it. And as we practice this philosophy, we will then see greater deeds being done every single day. Those greater deeds, eventually, for some, they start to call them miracles. I don't know if they're miracles, because I think the body was designed to be self-healing, self-regulating mechanism. And I think that if we give it all the chances that we possibly can and the support, and that's where moving our bodies properly Eating properly plays such pays such dividends. If we're not moving properly and we're not eating properly, we're not setting the body up to be the to do its best job. So this philosophy of helping the body become a self healing, self regulating mechanism is absolutely paramount. And as we move forward, here's why. So this is where the rubber hits the road. Let's just say that you have an injury, you have a shoulder injury, and you decide or your doctors decide that the pain that your shoulder's given you should not be there, that pain is bad, that there's nothing to gain from the pain. So therefore you give it a shot, I don't know, a steroid shot, a muscle pain, something, right? You make that pain go away. And now this innate wisdom within the body has been told to shut up, flat out in that moment, stop talking, you're not worthy, you shut up. I don't want to listen to you anymore. I don't care what you have to say. I don't like the message, so I'm going to tell you to shut up. And I'm going to go right back to doing what I'm doing. And I'm going to continue to use my shoulder and move because now all of a sudden that pain signal that when you were trying to talk to me, I told you to shut up and therefore I can keep doing what I'm doing. I know that sounds kind of harsh, but it's 100% true. That's what we've been kind of taught. We've been kind of cultivated when it comes to the healthcare system that you shouldn't have any, any you know, say unfriendly in, in, in moments in your body when it comes to experiencing what's going on. You shouldn't have discomfort, you shouldn't have a headache, shouldn't have any pain. So here's what I'm gonna say to all of that for the moment. In this journey, when you become a great listener, the struggle ends and the journey begins. The fear of the unknown. So when you have pain and you think that the only remedy is to make the pain go away, there's a lot of fear that gets wrapped up in there that heightens the pain. You think, well, what if this pain doesn't go away? And because that's the only answer here, there's, and then that creates more anxiety, creates more anxiousness. What else is going to interfere in my life? And it goes down this whole rabbit hole. 
But if we flip it over and we start to become great listeners, and this is part of the philosophy, and we start to ask ourselves, what is my body asking me for? What does my body need? What can I do for my body? When you practice these, it'll work on the smaller level. And as you get better and better on a smaller level of just healing from a little finger cut to the next thing you know, you have a, a bum knee, something's hurt, or low back pain. When you start listening to your body and we do more to help the process and the innate wisdom than we do interfere. When this happens, down the road, when you really need to lean on your innate wisdom and you really need to lean on the ability for the body to heal itself, you'll have experience. I'm also going to tell you this. Listen, this is a great philosophy, but you don't get to leapfrog it. And so these are foundations. You have to practice them. Just like if we go back to movement and you're trying to get really good at movement and you want to run a marathon and you say, oh, 26.2 miles, it's a marathon. You can't start there. You don't get to do that. That'll make things worse. There's no different than your philosophy, how you approach your health all your life. Every time you had pain, you took a pain reliever. Every time you had a headache, you take something for your headache. Every time you have a stomach ache, you take an antacid. Every time your blood pressure goes up, you take blood pressure medications. Cholesterol goes up, you take cholesterol-lowering medications. Listen, folks, that's how you tell your body, shut up. That's how you give your body the middle finger. And I know that sounds harsh, but it's the truth. And that's why we have a culture right now that just moves into this sick system. But the foundations of health will be, be based upon this. And I told you this is where the rubber hits the road. And I also told you this is going to be a little different approach about how we think, but how you move, how you eat, and how you think. So as we wrap this podcast up today, this Foundations of Health podcast here, here's what I want to think of. Give yourself a little bit of scorecard here. Go through the three things when it comes to the movement. How are you moving better when it comes to your range of motion, when it comes to your strength, and when it comes to your stamina, your literally your endurance, where are you there? Where do you need to make improvement? When it comes to the next part of this, when it comes to eating, how clean are you? And listen, pick one area, get better with that area, do the best that you can, keep it clean, organic, God's garden, root plant tree, walks in the garden, swims in the sea, eat it. If it's not, don't. Think about those little red blood cells, 2 million of them every single second that you're making. Give your, your body the best opportunity, set it up for that day that you might cut your finger. So you have all the tools ready to heal it. And listen, I'm dancing around saying other things, but listen, you're going to cut your finger. One day it might be a broken bone. Maybe it'll be a disease, but no matter what, your foundations will determine how you go through those. All right. The last but not least, how you think. And yes, positive thought is the most powerful thing we can have most likely, or at least potentially in our lives. Our philosophy is going to drive most of that. Maybe you borrow mine. Maybe you, and I borrowed it. I didn't, I didn't come up with this, but the body is a self-healing, self-regulating mechanism. We know it. We've seen evidence of it our entire lives. Can you become a better listener? When you become a better listener, I promise you, the struggle starts to go away and the journey begins. And the journey is an enjoyable one because you see the benefits, the entire ride, the entire walk through here. All right. We're at the end, folks. I hope that that finds a special place and you continue to motivate you a little bit to continue to take the great actions that you're taking or to enhance ones that maybe you could be taking a little bit better. Keep doing your thing. Keep sharing this out. Keep spreading the love when it comes to our, our podcast here. I appreciate all of you for showing up. And of course, we're going to continue to take deliberate action for your mind, your body, overall wellness. Y'all be awesome.